So I learned something interesting this week from my brother about ziggurats and art history. What is a ziggurat, you may ask? Uh, well, archaeologists have uncovered about 20 of these things, um, mostly in modern-day Iraq, which would be considered really ancient Babylon. And uh, these are the Mesopotamian versions of pyramids, really. If, if you look at them, that's sort of what they look like. But uh, rather than being smooth on the sides like pyramids, they're, they're um, kind of stair-stepped. And at the top of these, of these big towers would be a temple for uh, whatever deity that they worshipped. Uh, a ziggurat would be hollow on the inside. There wouldn't be much in there other than just to, to build it up to the top. And at the top, typically, you would have something like a bed and some food or some sort of offering. And the idea was you would uh, try to entice whatever god it was that you worshipped to come from heaven uh, into that temple and really descend as a, a stairway from heaven down to earth. It was a way to try and get god to come to you. Uh, there's an interesting Babylonian creation myth that speaks about a ziggurat that is uh, apparently at the center of the earth, this access point, and, uh, and it is this uh, direct line between heaven and earth in order to get, um, to get gods to, to come visit earth. Well, this may sound somewhat familiar uh, because of the Tower of Babel that we hear about in Genesis 11, where humans uh, at this point build a great city, and within the city they build this tower, this ziggurat, in order to uh, stretch up to the heavens. Well, uh, because of the unity of their language, they are able to accomplish this great feat, and, and so God... Uh, with concern, says if, if they were able to do this, what, uh, what else will they be able to do? Indicating, really, what if your mind is set towards evil and you're unified in that purpose, then all sorts of bad things can happen. And so God scatters them throughout the earth by, by confusing their language. Uh, Genesis 9, just a little bit before this, after the flood, God tells Noah to, uh, to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And at, at Babel, you see people doing the opposite. They say, let's stay here. Let's not go out. Let's not um, fill the earth. Let's stay here, build a great city and a tower that reaches to heaven to make our name great. <clears throat> and so uh, a ziggurat in many ways was was an attempt to control God. It was an attempt to say, we want God to come to us on our terms. So we'll build this temple uh, and this stairway so that God might descend from heaven and come to us and we will entice him to come to us. So here's the interesting point that I, that I learned this week is that ziggurats made very little of a lasting impact on art history. When you look at architecture. Uh, typically, each um, succeeding generation will build on the architecture in some way or adapt it um, from, from previous generations, but you don't really see that with ziggurats. You never really see ziggurats moving beyond Babylon, ancient Babylon, and the historian Paul Johnson says this, that it's hard to imagine, quote, any monumental form of architecture involving such prodigies of construction and multitudes of labor over so long a period, which has left so little mark on later cultures. It's ironic that they attempted to make a name for themselves through their own ingenuity, and it actually had somewhat of the opposite effect, where they, they did not leave much of a lasting mark on history that came after them. And so my question that I've been thinking about is, what does this teach us? What can we learn from this as the church? And, and this, is what, this is what I've been thinking, is that it's easy for us to focus on style over substance. We can attempt to, to build things, use our own ingenuity. We can try to uh, adapt to culture enough. We can offer an interesting product to try and entice people to come to our church. We can try to just entertain people. We can try to build our own kingdom, thinking that God will then, uh, in a sense, come into our ziggurat, and our church, and bless what we're doing. And we can attempt to make a name for ourselves based on our own ingenuity of what we can build for God. 
Well, there's an interesting uh, set of verses in Revelation chapter 2 that uh, that can be very concerning. And it says this in Revelation 2, verse 4 and 5. It says, But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. The irony is that, uh, that of course, the lampstands here are representing the church, representing churches. And the irony is that we might build our own church up enough uh, as, as a form of ziggurat, and Jesus will come and visit us. Just as a God would come to a ziggurat, uh, they believed, except what Jesus will do when he comes to us is actually remove the lampstand, remove the influence of our church. And so we do want to give our best to God. We do want to, uh, uh, nothing wrong with making great art, with making great architecture. Uh, there's nothing wrong with trying to do what you do at church well, and we want to do that well. However, uh, I just want to be careful not to get caught up in, in style over substance. If we lose the heart of what it means to be the church uh, in, in, a, uh, in an attempt to sort of do church in a flashy, fancy sort of way, I believe we're in trouble. Because the world doesn't need to see uh, ziggurats built by Christians. Uh, doesn't need to, uh, to see the best that we have to offer, our own best ingenuity. What the world needs is an encounter with God on his terms, and may God use us to draw people into that encounter. You know, ziggurats are now uh, no more than just a footnote in art history and, and history of architecture. And I believe if we're not careful to keep Jesus the head of, of the church and the center of the church, then, then our churches may become exactly that in the future as well. And so may we... Uh, Put the focus where where it should be. Focus on on Jesus, and uh, and I believe that uh, He will bless our influence if we keep Him at the center and follow His lead. And so, I uh, hope you have a great week. I hope this has been encouraging to you and challenging to you, as it has been challenging to me. We'll see you again soon.